The Tom Woods Show, episode 1541. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Folks, the self-taught Ron Paul curriculum, which I helped create, gives parents their mental health back and students a top-notch education. In addition to the traditional subjects, how about two years' worth of business, as well as a course on personal finance for teens, a course on public speaking, the kinds of stuff nobody learns anywhere, but which will give your students a major leg up. Plus, through my link only, get $160 worth of free bonuses when you join. That link is ronpaulhomeschool.com. Hey everybody, Tom Woods here. Got a great episode for you today, but before we get to it, I want to let you know, for those of you who are listening as the episodes come out, this is November 25th, 2019, and this entire week is the best week of the year to get your web hosting because Bluehost is having its Black Friday sale. And remember, if you get your hosting through my link, I will help get you traffic to your website or blog because that's the most depressing thing of all. And that's the thing that dooms most sites is nobody showing up. I'll get some people over there for you by promoting it on my program. And I'll get you into my bloggers group where we can all help each other. I got some great bonuses for you. So check this all out at tomwoods.com slash publicity. That's where you'll find all the goodies that you get. These are all absolutely free. And this is the best week of the year to do it. So do not put this off. Go grab this. Go get started immediately. Now, today we are talking to the great Dominic Frisbee, who is the author of the brand new book, Daylight Robbery, How Tax Shaped Our Past and Will Change Our Future. He writes a weekly investment column for Money Week about gold and finance. And I really think you're going to find what he has to say. Very interesting. It's a really, really interesting book, by the way. Linked, of course, at tomwoods.com slash 1541. Dominic, welcome. Thank you very much, Tom. This book, which I've just introduced to the folks, must have been such an undertaking. It exhausts me just thinking about writing what is essentially kind of like a skeleton history of civilization in order to cover the topic you're hitting on here, namely taxation. What on earth would motivate you to do such a thing? You you have no idea, Tom. I did a I had this idea that, you know, in a zombie film, a trope of every zombie film is this idea of patient zero, the patient where the zombie virus starts. And the hero of the zombie film has to get to patient zero and either kill patient zero or patient zero will give her the an- the antidote that he needs to save the world. And I had this idea that that tax is patient zero in a society. If we want to fix our society, we need to fix our system of tax. And I did uh, an Edinburgh sh- a show at the Edinburgh Festival about tax in 2016. Uh, and it was a tremendous success. It sold out and I got a laurel and good reviews and all this kind of thing. And everyone was going, oh, I can't believe all these interesting things about tax. And how did you make tax funny? It was a stand up show. And um, one of the things that came out of the show was a was a book deal. I got a book deal with Penguin. And I thought to myself, at the Edinburgh Festival finishes at the end of August. And I thought, I can knock this book out before Christmas, between September and December, uh, the three months uh, over the autumn or fall, as you call it. And then I'll start work on my next year's Edinburgh show in January. And it took me, what well, I thought would be three months, it took me three years. Oh, my. that that's a That's a project. <laughs> it is. And, and as you say, like, there has never been a civilization without taxation. And the very first taxes were enacted in ancient Mesopotamia, you know, when man first settled. And it's probable that this idea of duty to the greater collective existed even in the hunter-gatherer societies that predated civilization. So as a result, I found myself as you say, writing the entire history of civilization through the prism of taxation. But what I bet, I bet there is a difference in the way people looked at it because I, my feeling is that in ancient times, people understood clearly this is tribute or this is, uh, I, I'm being forced to do this against my will for heaven knows what reason. Whereas today, there's much a much greater apparatus of propaganda around taxation that, oh, it's actually voluntary. Uh, you actually consented to this. We have a social contract whereby we all agreed to abide by the, you know There's a huge apparatus surrounding it to get people to consent to it. Whereas I think in the old days, it was probably more or less just brute force. Um, well, there certainly was brute force. 
and you're absolutely right where there's always this moral argument around taxation. You know, even you see it even in the use of the word, things like tax is your duty was an old word used for taxation and, and still is used today, of course. We have duties and tariffs on various goods. So there's always this moral argument. And, and yeah, the, those who believe in large government, you know, social democrats or even socialists will try and smear you as some kind of abhorrent person if you actually turn around and say, well, I don't actually think high taxes are a good thing. And I don't necessarily think that government is the best way to provide, you know, education or welfare or healthcare or so on. You know, and I, I was on a BBC radio program earlier in the week on with a, uh, a lady who's an MP for the Liberal Democrats, which is our sort of social democrat party what would be your sort of the equivalent of your democrat party although not as uh, influential but politically in the same place and she called me repugnant for suggesting that that high taxes aren't a good thing repugnant i mean how about that <laughs> so they will use and it's funny like there's examples of this all through history you know for example in uh, medieval times if you didn't want to go to war to fight uh, with your king um, you would have a tax levied against you. And it was called the cowardice tax. <laughs> ah, how about that? <laughs> yeah. The cowardice and, um, tax, you know, okay. A cowardice tax for those who didn't want to, uh, for knights who didn't want to go to the crusades with their king. And in fact, funnily enough, all through history, there is this relationship between taxes and war. And it's a weird sort of symbiotic two-way relationship where, you know, if you want to end war then end taxes. Because without taxes, wars aren't possible. Wars are paid for with taxation, either during the event or through debt, which is, of course, a tax on the future. And debt is also taxation without representation. And then, you know, a war is about conquering a, a country. And then once that country is conquered, you know, that country is plundered and then taxed. But at the same time, as wars are made possible by tax, taxes are made possible by war. And so, for example, you know, it's very hard. There's a proven track record of governments trying to raise taxes during peacetime and it making them extremely unpopular and then and then often being overthrown. But wars give them the excuse. And your great nation is a prime example of this. Until 1942, income tax was only paid by the very rich. And, you know, ordinary Americans were not affected by income tax. And then you had the 1942 Revenue Act, uh, which brought income tax to every man. And what tends to happen is the war goes away, but the tax remains. Or the tax might come back a bit in peacetime, but it never goes back to the levels it was before the war started. So tax enables war, and war enables tax. And by the way, there's a fantastic song that, if you can, you should play it on your program, that was commissioned in 1942 in order to make ordinary Americans celebrate the payment of income tax. And it was written by, commissioned uh, of the songwriter Irving Berlin and sung by Gene Autry. And the song goes, I paid my income tax today, a thousand planes to bomb Berlin, they'll all be paid for and I chipped in. That's one of the lyrics. And so was ever the link between war and tax. And this is supposed to be a happy song, but it's a very stark lyric when you think, uh, look, see those bombs bombers in the sky, Rockefeller helped to build them, so did I. And this was to, you know, to make it clear to Americans that their, their tax money was going to fund that war. Now, that's very interesting, especially when we contrast that with what goes on in U.S. foreign policy these days. Because, yes, Americans were angry after 9-11, but it's 2019 now. And for heaven's sake, none of them could care less about what's going on in Iraq or most of these countries. And so when the U.S. is engaged in, let's say, low-intensity wars there, or even, frankly, the most recent war in Iraq in 2003, it's being funded in different ways because Americans are getting tax cuts during this time. And so to them, it seems costless. And I can understand during the 1940s that there could be people who may well have been very happy to pay income tax because they looked at Hitler and he seemed like a unique evil. But you look at these two-bit nobodies in the Middle East – and you think, really? Is this really why my standard of living should be lowered? So it looks like they're using something other than taxation precisely for that reason. Debt is the answer. Right. And you have a, you have a chapter on debt and inflation. I do. And taxes in America are, are lower than the, the tax to GDP ratio in America is about 37, 38 percent, something like that. And in the UK, it's about 45, 46 percent. But it's much higher if you include debt 
and uh, inflation, you know, the debasement of money. But debt is, the first thing to note about debt, it is a tax on the future. But it is also taxation without representation because the social democrat argument is, well, you know, you're given your vote every four or five years and you vote for the, and you can say if you don't want these taxes through your vote. Now, of course, we all know how ineffective a vote, you're, you're choosing between Democrat and Republican. You're, you know, it's like choosing between a, a serial killer and a mass murderer, you know. But the, um, the nature of debt is it's also taxation without representation. And let me give you an example of why that is. It's because it's my kids who will be paying for the debt that's taken on by my government today. And, you know, World War I, the UK was fought between 1914 and 1918. And the UK only finished paying off its World War I debts in 2015, 100 years later. Can you believe that? The, the debts of World War One were only paid back, finally paid down three years ago, four years ago. And so I, who was born four generations, three generations after World War One, was paying for that war. And so, you know, debt is, I just regard it as, uh, the way governments use debt, I regard it as deeply immoral. And of course, you know, that war in Iraq, I think it's fair to say, without sounding like too much of a conspiracy theorist, that the perpetrators of 9-11, who, oh my goodness me, should they be punished? But it wasn't Iraq. You know, that 9-11 was used as an excuse to get involved in, overseas, in, in, in Iraq and take control of the tax base. Now, the tax base in Iraq, as well as the people, is, of course, its natural resources, its oil. Well, and that, that opens up quite a can of worms, and I, we've got so much to cover here. I'm yeah, just let's leave go somewhere it. else. <laughs> yeah, let's right. leave and, that one hanging. <laughs> yeah, not, not that I don't want to talk about it, but, but I, I feel like I owe it to you as the author of this book to jump around a bit. You started let me tell to you, say... Let me tell you, I was going to say, just, just as a, you just made me think of something just in saying what you said, but I, I'll tell you about amazing war tax that was levied in the Napoleonic Wars. And this was, uh, William Pitt was the English prime minister at the time of the Napoleonic Wars. And he was famous for taxing everything. And one contemporary said, wherever there is an object, he will tax it. And he taxed carriages, he taxed dogs, he taxed horses, he taxed signets, you know, uh, your signet ring, he would tax it, your crest of arms, windows, glass, he taxed everything. And among the many things he taxed was wigs and wig powder. And so, because wig powder became so expensive, poor people could no longer afford it because of the tax payable on wig powder. So they started using flour instead. And the result of that is it pushed the cost of flour up and made food, which was much more expensive on a relative basis back in those days because food production was far less efficient, push food prices up. But there was a, a group of people who decided that they were opposed to the Napoleonic War and in order to make their opposition, to, to show their opposition, they stopped wearing wigs and cut their hair very short according to the fashion of the continent. And so that Henry, uh, William Pitt's wig tax started a whole new fashion and that's why we wear our hair short today. It all started with this bizarre wig tax of William Pitt. And the tax continued until 1869 when people had long since stopped wearing wigs and using wig powder. See, there are stories like this all throughout history. In fact, the primary theme of your book, I would say, involves how taxation has shaped the development of civilization. And in fact, when you look back on it, it's interesting how many major historical events wind up turning on taxation, at least in part. I mean, obviously, the American War for Independence had a great deal to do with taxation. But we all know, I mean, obviously, an American and a British audience know all about that. But what would you say are lesser known areas of history where really they turned on something having to do with taxation? Once you start to look for tax stories and you start to look at the world through this prism of taxation, so much becomes clear. And suddenly things that were no longer explainable, suddenly you can understand why things happened as they did, why things are in the world as they are today, and why things will be as they are in the future. Because tax is power. It is control. And, you know, whether it's a king or an emperor or a government, if they lose control of, the, of, of tax revenue, they lose their power. And 
tax, the way we're taxed at the moment, we tax labor very heavily, but we don't tax assets much at all. And so we have created a society that's incredibly unequal and it's geared against the worker. The asset owner benefits in the way that the, the worker doesn't because the worker constantly and heavily pays taxes. Now, you can look through history, as you say, and every war, every single war was made possible by tax, as we said so. You can even things like, you know, every great building, you think of things like the pyramids or, or, or the White House was built, you know, with tax money or the labor of, of taxpayers or, or in many cases, slaves. And slavery is like, you know, a th- is 100% taxation, if you like, where you, you own none of your own labor. And you can even look at things like the Great Wall of China. Well, we think that the Great Wall of China was built to keep invaders out. As much as it was built to keep invaders out, it was built to protect tax revenue and tax goods coming in and out of China, particularly along the Silk Road. So buildings were built. Every revolution, every revolt was a rising up, an attempt to overthrow power and get rid of some economic injustice perpetrated by the tax system. And of course, we have you know no taxation without representation. Um, the French Revolution, uh, the Russian Revolution, in, uh, uh, you know the the unfair taxes levied against um, serfs in Russia. The Philippine Revolution began with the uh, cry of Pugad Lawin, in which he exhorted citizens to tear up their tax certificates. So it's not just wars and revolutions as revolts, though, but even things as apparently, you know, the first men on the moon, NASA was a tax funded operation. The attack of the Twin Towers, the Twin Towers were largely built with taxpayers money. You know, the birth of Christ, Mary and Joseph would not have been in Bethlehem had Augustus Caesar not levied that tax. Uh, They went there to either to pay taxes or or to uh, fulfill their, their duties to the census, which was, again, for the purposes of taxes. Had Augustus Caesar not levied that tax, they would never have been in in Bethlehem and Christianity would never have evolved in the way that it did. And eventually, by the same token, the eventual charge for which Jesus Christ was crucified was forbidding to pay tribute. In other words, there was a, you know, it was tax was the reason that he was crucified. So, you know, at the birth of Christ and at his death, there's a tax story. And You know, one of the things I used to do in my Edinburgh show, Tom, was actually to have the audience shout out events from history. And I would attempt to tell them the tax story behind that event. One of the only areas where there isn't a tax story, at least not obviously at first, is natural disasters. So, you know, the Great Fire of London or the plague or the the Indonesian tsunami or something like that. But even these events, you know, there's always a tax story in the rebuilding effort afterwards. There's always, you know, some, you know, London was rebuilt on the proceeds of a coal tax. And even the plague which swept through Europe in the uh, Middle Ages, there's a tax story there in that the plague effectively destroyed feudalism um, in that suddenly you know, it killed so many people. Suddenly there was a shortage of serfs and the value of labor increased and serfs were finally able to start charging for their labor and they were given their freedom. And so did the, you know, the poorest in society start handling money for the first time. And then again, once they were handling money, pretty soon after they were paying poll taxes and, uh, you know, their money was being taken from them. And even the name you have, you have because of taxes. Because again, until the um, 13, the 12, 13, 1400s, people had one name. And then when poll taxes started to be collected, leaders needed to differentiate people uh, in order to levy taxes. And so you'd be called Tom Smith after the job you did, you were a smith, or you'd be called after a prominent geographical location uh, where you lived. So it'd be Tom Smith as opposed to Tom from the woods, or you'd be named after your father uh, as opposed to Tom Johnson you know, son of John or Tom uh, McLeod. Mac is another word for for son of, or the Irish O'Shea means Shea's son. So even the names you have, you you have because of taxes. And now in in China, surnames go all the way back to, I think, two and a half thousand years BC. And they were first imposed by the emperor Fuji and F-U-X-I, you pronounce that. But even he imposed surnames for the very same reason, for the uh, levying of poll taxes. And it's just amazing how apparently unconnected things have got this tax story at their heart. And I suppose my big aim with this book is that, you know, in the Enlightenment, one of the great periods of human development, all the great philosophers of the Enlightenment, among other things, they talked about the morals of taxes. And you think about today, 
you know, libertarians talk about tax and they talk about how unjust income tax is in particular, and rightly so. But generally speaking, the morals of tax are not debated in the way that they were during the Enlightenment in the second half of the 18th century. And so one of my aims of this book is to just tell as many amazing tax stories as possible and get people thinking about tax and talking about tax once again, because as I say, tax is the zero patient. So many of society's ills start with inequitable taxation. And if we're to make the world a better place, and I think all of us want that, the place to start is to fix our system of tax. And that's the one thing a politician really does have the power to do. Politicians often complain that there's only so much they can do, but they can fix our system of tax. And boy, oh boy, does it need fixing. Well, I want to say a little something because I know you're very interested in cryptocurrency and you have some material in this book on that. In fact, I believe if I if memory serves, the chapter is called Crypto, the Tax Man's Nightmare. And I'd like to talk about that because from the point of view of an American where the the tax laws now basically say that Bitcoin is not basically being treated like money. So that what happens is if if I have some Bitcoin and then – the Bitcoin appreciates, and then I spend it. I have to track the difference between the value of the Bitcoin when I bought it, the value of the Bitcoin when I got rid of it. I have to declare that as a gain and be taxed on it. That doesn't seem like the tax man's nightmare to me. It seems like the tax man is making Bitcoin impossible to use. <laughs> what, what am I missing? Uh, well, you're absolutely right. And the bureaucracy involved with declaring your Bitcoin profits and losses if you use it on a, on a daily basis to buy and sell stuff is such a nightmare that most people don't bother to do it. And they just, um, you know, they're non-compliant. And I guess they're breaking the law. And I mean, you see lots of what we call Bitcoin whales, the Bitcoin millionaires. They've just renounced their U.S. citizenship. And they've gone to, you know, Roger Veer's gone to Japan. Others have gone to um, the Caribbean. You know, a lot of Americans have just made so much money from it. They've just renounced their citizenship. But I'll tell you why crypto is the tax man's nightmare. And that is, at the moment, income tax is in its various forms, is government's largest source of revenue. It accounts for roughly 50% of government revenue worldwide. And it's been so successful from the government's point of view because it's been an easy tax to collect because there is this clear relationship between employee and employer. And you can say to the employer, collect the taxes on behalf of this employee and the, the taxes are deducted at source and the employee never even had the money in his hands in the first place. You know, Chris Rock says, they, you don't pay tax, they take tax. That's a jack. And he's absolutely right. Now, why crypto is the tax man's nightmare is that the nature of employment is changing and more and more people are having multiple income streams. They're becoming freelancers, the gig economy, contingent workers, all these different words for it. And Ernst and Young have forecast that by 2030, so that's only 10, 11 years away, half the world's workforce will be what it calls contingent. And taxes are much harder to collect from contingent workers because you have to tax them after the event. Now, so just park that thought for a moment and then think of the nightmare that governments around the world have had taxing the intangible economy. Google, the internet, Apple, Amazon, uh, Starbucks, all these genius ways by which these large corporations avoid paying tax quite legally. And they, they park, you know, their intellectual property in one place where there's a, it's a low tax jurisdiction and they, they just make use of different tax laws around the world. And this is one reason why the intangible economy has been so incredibly successful, because it hasn't had to pay the same amount of taxes that the physical economy has had to pay. And governments, have, we know, the government tax systems are designed around a physical economy that you can touch and see that they, they still haven't got used to the Internet properly. And now if you think of the problems it's had taxing these intangible corporations, what happens when workers become intangible as well? So of this 50% of the global workforce that, are, that, that will be contingent, maybe as much as 30% will do work in multiple jurisdictions around the world through the internet. Some of them will be digital nomads. They'll be traveling from one jurisdiction to the other. They spend less than 183 days in each country. They're no longer resident of that country. 
And so we have things called non-DOMs in the UK, who are these extremely rich people who enjoy a special tax status. But the, the, the internet is going to make non-DOM status possible for ordinary workers. Now, 50% of digital nomads already today work in the crypto economy in some way, in the sense that they receive cryptocurrency as payment for their goods and services. And cryptocurrency makes sense to them because they work in the borderless economy that is the internet. It makes sense to be paid in borderless money. It's a pain in the ass if you're a Brazilian and you get paid in dollars and you haven't got a US dollar bank account and yada, 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 and you happen to be in Thailand at the time or, you know, whatever. You know, Forex is a nightmare and the internet still hasn't, well, it has sorted that out in the form of Bitcoin. Government money hasn't sorted that out. But what do you do? when suddenly your workforce, who previously had been easily taxable, are now suddenly not so easily taxable because the jurisdiction that the tax money they should be paying is not clear, and they're being paid in money over which you have no control. You know, as a libertarian, that is a beautiful thing. <laughs> but it's a, it's a big headache for governments. Well, let me ask you... Uh what I think would be the major objection that you would get. People would say, well, these are interesting stories you're telling, but it seems a little bit perverse to be focused on taxation when the fact is we get all these wonderful benefits from taxation. I mean, look at all the good that's done with the, the public money. So to nitpick about the way it's collected, I mean, maybe that's a mild concern, but you set that against all the benefits of it, it seems trivial. What's the problem with that? Well, Again, this is uh, one of those arguments that will never die. But is government the best means to provide the best possible education, the best possible welfare, the best possible health care at the lowest possible price? And I would argue, no, it isn't. Certainly not education. You know, around the world, private schools outperform public schools. And, you know, the reaction shouldn't be to ban private schools. And, make, you know, and there's something highly immoral about, you know, government setting school curricula. And we have the internet. It is the most powerful learning tool ever invented. You know, why do we need schools in their current form? Most of um, the syllabus that you learn at school is designed for a different age and it's in very little real use in the, you know, how much, how many schools make computer code obligatory? You know, the guy who reads computer code in today's age, it's like being literate in medieval times. It just gives you such a huge advantage over everyone else. Computer code should be compulsory if you believe in state education. And yet, I mean, I'm not sure about America, but so there's so many flaws with government services in their current form. And, you know, I'm a great believer in the efficiency of markets. And, you know, if there's a problem, the market will fix it one way or another. And, you know, so much of what government currently does you know, education, we've got the internet, healthcare, look at the way that Silicon Valley is, you know, trying to, as it puts it, solve the healthcare problem. But there's so many ways by which prevention, early warning signs, all these things that you get as, by using data in healthcare, you know, there's so many ways by which the free market is already, and, you know, public transport, you look at something like Uber, it's so much better than public transport. Why do you even need public transport? Uber's, and when we go to driverless cars, as sooner or later we will, you know, it's going to be even cheaper. So my argument of, to that is government is not the best possible way to provide these services at the lowest possible cost, at the highest possible standard. The free market does it better, but the free market could do it much better if government stayed out of it. And I just think I actually had two chapters on the future of government services, but I took them out of the book because it was getting a bit long winded. But the that that's the argument that I make is that so many government services are just being made to look redundant by the free market and new technology. Well, the book is Daylight Robbery, How Tax Shaped Our Past and Will Change Our Future. I'll link to it at tomwoods.com slash 1541. Do you have a website? Do you know, you do, I, I do, Tom. And do you know why it's called Daylight Robbery? Because that expression, which means brazen theft, it actually derives from the window tax that we used to pay in uh, in Europe in the uh, 1700s and 1800s. And uh, when, when there was a big debate in Parliament as to whether we should get rid of the window tax or not, um, it, the MPs all cried out daylight robbery. And that's where that expression derives from. It's, it's terrific. I, I absolutely love it. So in addition to linking to your book on my show notes page, is there a website you'd like me to link to as well? Sure. You can link to dominicfrisbee.com slash blog. 
And, uh, you know, you can read some of the stuff I post in there. On You can follow me on Twitter at Dominic Frisbee. And I think I've got a Facebook page as well, Facebook slash Dominic Frisbee. I'm, all, I'm on all the usual social media if people want to argue with me. Okay, Dominic <laughs> Frisbee, D-O-M-I-N-I-C, and then Frisbee, F-R-I-S-B-Y, DominicFrisbee.com slash blog. So, okay, I'll link to that stuff at TomWoods.com slash 1541. Go check out Daylight Robbery, folks, because you're going to learn a lot of interesting material. And thanks so much for your time, Dominic. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me, Tom. You're a great interviewer. Okay, folks. Now, remember, this is Black Friday week. And starting on Black Friday, I'm going to be having an absolute blowout over at Liberty Classroom, which is my adult enrichment site. Let's put it that way. We've got something like 25 courses there in history, economics, other topics. It's the stuff they kept from you. And it's taught by me and by people you've heard on this program, all of whom have PhDs and are well-established in the academic world, but who, unlike much of the academic world, actually tell the truth. It's my dashboard university. You can learn the stuff they kept from you while you're on the go, and you can smash people in debates from now until the end of time. And can you really put a price tag on that? Our Black Friday deal is on the Lifetime, or Master, membership, which also includes, as a bonus, all 400 videos, which are also available as audio files to listen to on the go, that I created for the Ron Paul curriculum. And you will get a lot out of those. All of Western civilization from the Hebrews up to the present with me as your guide. You're going to learn a lot. And you will feel like you are the master of the universe. Whereas right now you feel like there are gaps in your knowledge and you're embarrassed that if anybody ever brought up this topic or that, you wouldn't know what to say. Never, ever feel that way again. You will dominate the room, ladies and gentlemen. So starting on Black Friday, that is November 29th, 2019, go grab it at libertyclassroom.com. Go grab it for somebody who's dear to you or for yourself or for that student in your life too who's off at college learning heaven knows what. Get it for that student. The possibilities are endless. So libertyclassroom.com. Keep that in mind on Black Friday. I'll see you tomorrow. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit tomwoods.com to subscribe to the show for free and we'll see you next time. Like the sound of The Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at podsworth.com.